Good morning and welcome. Let's all stand together. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the soldiers of the cross. If I draw your banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for If you believe that, what you've been singing this morning, say amen. 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 This morning, uh, God has already blessed. We uh, had in the first service a couple join uh, our church family, uh, Bob and Penny Mauer. So we welcome them to the church family. Uh, and also, before we begin today, I just want us to uh, bow our heads and pray for some special needs. Some of you may be aware that Betty Clevenger's sister and brother-in-law were in a head-on accident and uh, multiple injuries, uh, critical injuries. We pray for them uh, as they are being helped by doctors and physicians and, and uh, those working with them. Continue to pray for Teresa Mize's 20-year-old nephew. Uh, we pray for him, Nick. Malcolm Paxton is now in hospice care in Hamilton. We pray for Malcolm. We lift up Pat Lofren. We continue to pray for Sandy George. And we pray for Norma Woods. Um, and as we pray, I want to thank the Lord for the church, for all of you who helped serve the Pittman bowling family yesterday in the funeral. It was a tremendous testimony. I want to thank you all. If you had any part of that, even praying for us, we thank you uh, that, that God was honored. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we recognize that these are just the needs that we're aware of, and there are many in this place today. I pray for those that are not just here, but those that might be watching from home and would like to get out, but they can't. Lord, we lift up everyone that has been mentioned. We ask that your hand would be upon them. And we pray for the bowling family and the loss of Ron's sister, Donna. God, we pray as a nation uh, for our military. We pray for those that are still in Afghanistan praying to get out. Lord, we pray you would make a way. Lord, we also pray for the East Coast and for New Orleans, all the devastation that has taken place. So we come today here grateful, thanking you for letting us worship you. And as we begin a new series today in the book of 1 Peter, we do want to stand. We need to stand for you. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Go ahead and be seated. I see a number of faces that I haven't seen in a while. We're glad to have you all back and here with us today. We say welcome to our guest. And I want to read to you a few verses from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Jesus says in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And then a little later in that same chapter, he says in verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Amen? Well, there is nothing greater in the life of a pastor than to get a phone call from a little girl who says, Brother Greg, I want to be baptized. And I said, Journey Hoke, why do you want to be baptized? And she said, because I've asked Jesus into my heart. And Journey, I, we are proud of you and thank God for you, watching you grow up and to love the Lord. Uh, this is Jason and Jennifer's little girl. Mommy's back here with her. I know there might be some family here. Why don't you all stand so we can say welcome. Give them a good welcome. Will you do that? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Okay, Journey, have you asked Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? Amen. Upon that profession of faith and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job. Amen. Well, we found out something this morning. Uh, Tim has been working in New York and got home last night at 9.30, and I asked everybody how they felt, and Tim said, a little tired. So I want everybody to stand up, and I want you to find somebody that looks a little tired and give them a good welcome. Will you do that? skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at his right hand stands one who is my Savior. I take him at his word and name. Christ died to save me this side. Savior, 
My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always lived for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior was, my Savior is, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. Yes, living, dying, let me I speak my solace from this spring That he who lives to be my king Once died to be my savior That he will leave his place on high And come for sinful men to die You count it three so before I knew my Savior, my Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. Just live and die, let me. My strength, my solace from this spring That he who lives to be my king Once died to be my savior That he who lives to be my king Once died to be my savior Continue to praise him this morning. Give the Lord a praise.
you may be seated. So um, this is one of the songs that we did in our um, Gaither Camden homecoming. Um, he touched me, so um, I saw Derek this morning. I said, hey, you want to sing that at uh, 1045? So here we go. where Landon gets his voice, don't you? Thank you, Derek. Great job. I want to go ahead and dismiss our kids to Children's Church. We're glad to have you up to third grade. Listen, adults, don't be trying to make a dash right now. The kids, God bless you for being here. It's a big deal to be in church. Give them a good hand. Amen? <laughs> Amen. I want you to take your Bible this morning, and I want you to meet me at 1 Peter. Over the next few weeks, your Bible should just about fall open to 1 Peter as we begin a new series walking through this book entitled Stand. Stand. You ever heard anybody say in the midst of an emergency or something happening, some kind of trauma, don't just stand there, do something? Uh, and then on the opposite end of that, there's don't just do something, stand, listen for God. Well, this morning, I want us to begin to think about what it really means to stand as a Christian. It's one thing to sing about it on Sunday morning. It's another thing to live it Monday. It's one thing to say amen in church. And another thing to praise God when the bottom of your life falls out and you're wondering what's going to happen next. 
And that's why I love about that song, He Touched Me. Derek said, join me as a believer. We can say there's been a time when Jesus changed my life. Amen? He touched me. In May of 2001, there was a man named Eric Wyanmayer who accomplished something that about at that time 150 people a year could accomplish. He reached the top of the 9,029 foot peak of Mount Everest. The only difference in Eric and many other folks who accomplished it was that he was legally blind. His autobiography was entitled, Touch the Top of the World, A Blind Man's Journey to Climb Farther Than the Eye Can See. And that book simply was asking the question, what are you going to do when you face a choice? What are you going to do when times get tough? Are you going to go forward or are you going to retreat? Are you going to let the obstacles stop you or will you keep pressing on regardless of the opposition and the trouble. Well, I introduce to you today a book that we've read many times, and no doubt many of you have as well, that deals with a letter that is written in a time when Christians are having to make some tough decisions. Now, I want you to be reminded that in Scripture today, that who Peter's writing to does not compare to what we're going through today. He's talking about real persecution. You see, what the church has come through is real inconvenience. Persecution, listen to me, is that believer that we're praying for this morning in Afghanistan that wonders if they're found, if their family will be killed. That's persecution. Father, have your way this morning as we begin this journey I know there are other people other guys that could preach this way better than me but this morning you've called us for such a time as this right now to hear your word so my challenge to our church family right now is God help us to stand in Jesus name we pray amen 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To the pilgrims of the dispersion, and here's a good, helpful, uh, something to help us define this dispersion. Your translation may say scattered throughout in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, to the pilgrims. His target are believers who are living in what we would know as modern-day Turkey. The author is Peter. Now, I would probably say we know as much or more about Peter than, than any of the disciples. He was a fisherman. He was called early as a disciple. He walked with Jesus and saw Jesus begin to gather this group of men who would follow him and change the world. Simon, who became Peter in the Greek. It's an important feature here when Jesus asked him who he is and he says, Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, upon that rock, upon that confession, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter, who denies Jesus three times on the way to Calvary. Peter, who has his life his highs and his lows recounted in the book of Acts, Peter, who God uses to preach the message at Pentecost and sees 3,000 saved in a day 
This is the person we're talking about who's writing a word of encouragement to persecuted believers. Peter saw the power of God in his life. He experienced the power of God in his life. And he desired to be obedient to God's plan. And I want to tell you something this morning, church. If you really want to see God move in your life, then start walking in obedience. You say, what do you, say? What do you mean, Brother Greg? I mean, I mean, don't cave in to the devil every time he tempts you. Don't think that it's hopeless or useless or that you're going to lose the battle. I'm saying stand on the, the rock of Jesus, stand on the promise of God's word, and see what God begins to do in your life. Now I realize that winning and losing is all part of life. The older I get, really the less I care about winning personally. So I've stepped back from my competition with Renee over all these years, and I've just chosen to let her beat me at anything we do. But when it comes to the things of God, God does not cut deals. He, do, he doesn't say do a little bit of this and a little of that. He says when you give your life to me, we sing songs about I surrender all. I'm talking about you fully committing your life to me. And when time comes to take a stand, that you stand for what I have taught you. What have I learned from Peter's life? Okay, this is free. This is not in your outline. This is bonus territory. Number one, no one is above failing. Nobody here. Daryl, nobody. As soon as we think we've got it all together, we have set ourselves up for a collapse that's monumental. Number two, when you fall, when you fail, you don't have to stay down. Amen? Anybody ever stumbled, ever tripped? I told you, I tripped outside changing the sign. Did a nice one and a half back roll. Got up, dusted my pants off, and heard... <laughs> only to look across the street, and a guy witnessed it all. You know what, I, I got up, I dusted myself off, looked at him and said, First Peter says you don't have to stay down when you fall. Of course I didn't say that, I was humiliated. But that's what Peter's life shows us. And I can assure you that there will be times in your life when you trip. When you trip spiritually. Let me tell you what that does not mean. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It means that as long as we are in the flesh, we are going to make mistakes. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there's coming a day when that will no longer be. When we are in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Went to the cemetery yesterday. You know what I got to tell the family before we left? This isn't it. This is a temporary place. And one day this grave's going to burst wide open and cancer's not going to heaven. Anything you've got's not going to heaven. Why? Because our old nature's sinful. These bodies have to be changed. So the loved one that we've come to pay respects to, the Bible says to be absent from the Lord is to be present or be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we're in the presence of God. Our soul is. But this body will be buried and later resurrected and changed and made fit for heaven. Now, how's God going to do that? I'm just going to leave that in the creator of the world's hands. Amen? If he can create this world, if he can form that precious baby in the womb of a mom, Put your hand on your heart right now. Feel that beat? Some of you men, keep looking. You'll, you'll get to it, okay? You guys know what I'm saying. Feel that? That's one less heartbeat than we'll ever have. And God has created us for a purpose, and that is to know him. And he's given us a reason to live called life, to glorify him. And what he's called believers to do is when you come to Christ, is to stand on the promises and to trust him all the way home all the way home I've asked I've been able to walk uh, Kobe to school that's one of my jobs I told you and and uh, Thursday I said Kobe could you find your way to church if I weren't with you could you get can you could you come back to church 
you say, Brother Greg, how simple is that? Well, if you're a first grader, it might be a little overwhelming. I don't know. I just want to make sure that if for some reason he could find his way to the church. You know, there's a song, there was a song by Al Denson that said, uh, when I get lost, take me to the church. Take me to the cross, high on that steeple. The, you know, the place where God saves the people. So it's the cross. Peter tells us that no one's above it, failing, and no one has to stay down. And you might be here this morning and feel like you have just ruined your life. Well, I've got good news for you. There is a Savior who puts broken pieces back together. My mom and dad are into jigsaw puzzles, I would say, more than anybody sitting in this room. If you visit their house, you're on your way to the middle bedroom because they're going to show you the recent put-together. And they'll tell you how hard it was. But they're so proud, and, and oftentimes they get to the end, and, and Dad will wrestle, this piece doesn't fit, this piece doesn't fit, and he'll cut out a little piece and make it fit. You see, Peter reminds us that God puts pieces back together. I told you all once that uh, we, we have the Lord's Supper table back here. It has a nice piece of protective glass on it. And one Saturday evening, I thought I would uh, get it ready for, uh, before the service. And so it means you have to navigate down a few steps with it by yourself. And nobody's here. I can do it. I can drag. I can get it here. And I can even do it leaving that piece of glass on top of it. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and look at me. As I was holding that table, I watched that glass slide right off. Good thing it was tempered glass. Whoosh. They said, Brother Greg, what did you do? Well, that night we served the Lord's, the next night served the Lord's Supper without glass on the table. And your pastor went down and personally bought a new piece of glass for the new table. And I'm telling you today, why? Because I want a clean soul. What are you saying, Brother Greg? We make messes sometimes when we do it by ourselves. Anybody want to say amen? When we don't want any help? And I think sometimes when we don't want help, is we, we, we realize we, we can probably, we know how to do it. In church life, it doesn't work that way. Because God calls us all to be part of the body. So there may be times that we need to step back so that somebody else can do what we've been doing maybe for a long time. Give them an opportunity. Give them a shot. Well, what if they're Peter? What if they mess up? They're no different than we are. We can do the same thing. So he writes this letter, and he's writing a letter of encouragement to believers in this modern-day Turkey in difficult days. It's written around 63, 64 A.D., so you could say roughly 30 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And he's writing during the reign of a Roman emperor named Nero. Now in 64 AD, Rome was burned to the ground. And it was the belief that Nero was the one who set the fire. He was willing to destroy everything they had, listen, so that he could build bigger and better and flex the muscle of this new Roman empire, but he underestimated something. The Romans were furious at him, and he didn't realize how mad they'd be. So he had to find a scapegoat, and guess who it is? The Christians. The Christians did this. The Christians were the reason that Rome burned. They were already hated as Jews, and now that gave Rome just more ammunition to persecute them. So Peter writes this letter during this climate. If you have your outline, here's the first thought. Peter preached the gospel. He experienced and relied on the power of God, and his desire was to be obedient to the things of God. Now this letter was intended to be passed around. 
one thing that, that I love to do, uh, I, I normally open the mail, I get the mail quicker than Renee, so when I get home, I stop the mailbox, and I love to see a handwritten personal note. Do you? I'm not talking about, well, like a good neighbor state farm form letter, I'm talking about Brother Greg Jackson. Or, or sometimes they come and say, Renee Jackson, and I want to open that so bad before she comes home. And I'll lay it on the table and I'll wonder the rest of the time. I wonder what it says. And then you open it up and there's some personal greeting. I want to encourage you to write a letter to somebody this week. Maybe your spouse. Guys, listen to me. Men, maybe it would be, honey, thank you for the way you serve us, serve me. Help me never take it for granted. Maybe it's to one of your children that you haven't talked to in a while and, and you're waiting on them. I, listen, I know how parenting can be. Uh, you're waiting on them to call you. Well, they haven't called me this week. How about you writing them a letter and saying, I just want to say my, my view of you as your dad, how proud I am to see you being a good parent, loving your kids. I want you to know I love you. Encourage somebody like that. Or another believer. When was the last time you wrote your Sunday school teacher a note? Folks, listen, a preacher gets all the, all the accolades. What about the Sunday school teacher? What about you faithful folks that fixed a dish for a family that most of you don't even know, other than Ron Bowling, the brother, and meet the needs and, and help them in a difficult time? You see... Peter preached the gospel, and you all are preaching the gospel with your life. You, you, you don't have to have the title of pastor to preach the gospel. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Romans, how beautiful are the feet of the, of the one who preaches the gospel. That's you. Wherever you go, wherever you're taking it. So this letter, listen, it's not a copy and paste email that blasts out to everybody. This handwritten letter is to be passed around. Here, right field, you take it, and when you're done, move it to right center and left center and left, and you all make sure you read it. And it's going to, uh, this description, pilgrims, or it could be sojourners or temporary residents. Verse 2, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. This is his greeting. And let me kind of just break this down as simple as Brother Greg knows how to help you understand. When he says elect, I want to remind you this morning that our Heavenly Father knows who will be saved. Say, Brother Greg, how does he know that? He created us. He created us. The elect are the saved. I remember a preacher named Ergen Canner say, uh, instead of trying to figure out who the elect are, why don't we share the gospel and God will show us who the elect are? The Holy Spirit will do the saving. But I also want you to be reminded of something Scripture talks about. Flip over to the right to 2 Peter Chapter 3, 2 Peter, chapter 3, a few pages to the right, verse 9. Peter writes, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want you to quote, if you will, with me, John 3 16. Let's say it. For God so loved the world that he gave that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let me tell you something this morning. God's desire for every life is to know him and to be saved. I'm a whosoever will preacher. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
So how does a person come to that point? By the drawing, by the wooing, by the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. I remember the night I got saved. I, I, I could not fight it any longer. I didn't care what people thought. I was going to settle it once and for all. I remember laying my head down at night in the bed saying, God, thank you that I know that I'm saved and I'm going to go to heaven regardless of what this world has in front of me. I was a 14-year-old boy that thought I was going to play NBA basketball. Thank you for your kindness and your, no, no, your less than sarcastic responses there. You know, when you're 14, your biggest concern is how dark is your mustache or, or how good do your Jordache jeans look. You don't think about big problems. You don't think about having to stand for your faith. But I'm telling you, our young people are dealing with stuff we never had a clue about. For most of us, the biggest deal was, are you going to smoke a cigarette or something? And then it just evolved. And here we are in a day where not only mature believers are called to stand, where people are, listen, where missionaries are serving, where they can't even be named. One commentator said, when you look at the greeting of Peter here, and he uses all these places in modern day Turkey, it's a, it's a reminder that he can't really identify them specifically for their safety says you're going to have to stand the elect God knows who will be saved God listen there's nothing that happens in life that's not filtered through the hands of God you'll say well brother Greg what are you saying I am I, I believe in the sovereign God who knows everything and I believe in the responsibility of man God throws the lifeline called salvation your responsibility is to receive it receive it Remember one of those early fishing trips, you know, by law, you're supposed to have certain things in your boat. One of those is a throwable device that's connected to the vessel. Why would you want it to be connected to the vessel? Because when Gary's out there uh, floundering in the water, what if I just threw him a, a, a life preserver and it wasn't connected to anything? There's nobody to pull him anywhere. Uh, good luck, Gary. We hope the current brings you this way. It don't work that way. God throws the life preserver and he draws us to himself. Amen? That's the good news of the gospel. The Bible says for sanctification, that means to be set apart. For obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Most would say this is a reference to the Old Testament and Moses' sprinkling of the sacrificial blood. This is a picture of the sacrificial system. The good news is Jesus paid it all once and for all. And when you come to him and receive his blood at Calvary, you can be forgiven. Jesus is not going back to the cross. It was in this dangerous anti-Christian culture. And folks, we are living in a post-Christian culture. I remember growing up as a boy, to me, the church was always a good thing. Christianity was always a good thing for our, our nation. And now we want to remove and move and pull out and delete and create this environment, listen, where we are the God, not the one who created us. So they lived in fear. They lived with a threat. They lived with uncertainty. Number two, Peter was writing in a time of persecution and the persecution would do one of two things. It would bring growth or it would allow bitterness to creep in. You see, when you know Christ, when you know you're saved, it doesn't exempt us from persecution. It doesn't exempt us from trials. Sometimes the doctor's report does come back bad. Sometimes we lose loved ones prematurely. But by the grace of God, it also gives us an opportunity to recognize that he's big enough to carry us and to lead us and to guide us through this thing called life. Now, life is more, listen, than just going through the motions. 
when Renee and I were dating 43 years ago, we, we started dating, she was kind of cutting edge and she had a video game. How many of you are kind of like gamers? You like, you like that kind of thing? Anybody? Okay, Rob, thank you. Raise your hand. Let me see them. Okay, over here. Oh, we got some boring people in left field over here. Okay, I see you, Ben. Do you know what the name of the first video game Renee and I played as we were dating? You ready? Pong. And you know what it was? It was a black and white screen. Number one, it was tennis. You don't play with a square ball, but they did on Pong. That's the way some of us live the Christian life. That it somehow is boring. I want to ask you this. When you look at this, let's just keep reading because Peter addresses it. All right? Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us or born us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Christian life isn't some uh, dead man walking life. The Christian life is praising God for saving you, uh, allowing you to be born again by his payment, his death, burial, and resurrection, and he's given you and me a hope in him, in Jesus. Now, the funeral we did yesterday... Ron's sister, Donna, was a retired Pentecostal preacher. So you say, okay, Brother Greg, how would you handle that? I preached the Bible. Thank God for her faithfulness to preach the Word. At the cemetery, a fellow came up to me, and I didn't know if he maybe was part of the church or a leader in their church or something, and here's what he said. I guess when it comes down to it, it really just comes down to Jesus, doesn't it? I said, that's exactly what it comes down to. When we get to heaven, there is no Southern Baptist floor. We won't hear the name Southern Baptist in heaven. We will hear the name Jesus. God made it absolutely impossible for man to take any credit in heaven. Listen to me. Nobody will be able to say, I got myself to heaven, and no one will be able to say, God sent me to heaven. Our unbelief is what condemns us. And Jesus makes a way. Listen, and we are living in a world where people don't know what to stand on because many have never heard the gospel clearly. You say, well, America is gospel saturated. It is if you're watching the right channels. And sometimes when you write, watch the right channels, that preacher will still try to tell you that you can do some things to help you get to heaven. But the Bible says we're running a race. Time is short. God has created you for his glory, and he's making a way for you and me to be saved in this thing called life. Life. The Bible says we have a living hope. We're alive in Christ. Through the resurrection of Jesus, we have undying hope. And then the Bible says in verse 5, or, or, or let's go back to 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Number 3. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus gives us an inheritance as his children. Now, there are two things about the inheritance that we look at, Peter makes pretty clear. First of all, it is imperishable. It will not fade away. Secondly, it is reserved. You know what that means? It's already there. The older I get, the older I get, the more I like to eat at places that have reservations. Not because I think I'm important, probably because I'm impatient. So I like these places that you can call ahead, and when you get there, they text you in your car. I kind of like that stuff. 
because I know I have a place. Okay, some of you, listen to me, some of you might think that you have a reserved seat in this sanctuary. Okay, Rob sits there every time. It's because he's six foot ten. And I say this lightly because I've, I haven't dealt with this problem. Probably because if you have, you've been too embarrassed to tell me about it. But I want to assure you that if I'm sitting somewhere and somebody comes in and acts like it's their seat, I'm just going to scoot over and say, welcome. Now, don't give them the Brother Greg uh, or, or Renee. This would be more like Renee. There ain't nobody seats in here. There's no way. Listen to me, folks. Reserved means it's already there. So your inheritance in heaven is awaiting. It's awaiting. That's what Peter says. In the time of struggle and tough days, remember that the inheritance is imperishable and it will be waiting for you. Verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Number four, persecution is no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter who I am, doesn't matter who you are, tough times can come. Verse 7 says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Persecution is no respecter of persons. It's temporary. The Bible says for a while. And it can be productive. Now, I'm, I'm not selling you that I wake up in the morning and say, Dear Lord, bring persecution that it may be productive in my life. I don't do that. But Peter says that it can. Do you hear me, Bill? That it can. A bell buoy rings only during the storm. The beating of the waves and the wind bring out the music that's inside it. And I believe that's a picture of what Peter's trying to say. The same thing is true when top trials reveal what's inside a person. Something happens and you just blast out cursing. That's an inside job that needs fixed. My dad will be 84 tomorrow. And uh, I praise God for that. But I'm telling you, I never heard my dad cuss. And when I did, I began to look for the return of Jesus because it was so rare. And most of the time when he ever did in my life, there was a time when he would come and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say things like that. I shouldn't act like that. Trials are going to come. Will they be productive or make me bitter? One preacher, I think John Maxwell said that uh, trials will make you better or bitter. But they're going to come. Number five. They'll come and they'll help you identify what your trust is in or they'll help remove the things in your life that are preventing growth. Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. And instead of cursing the darkness, Peter is saying in this book, stand on what you believe and what you know because there's a watching world that's wondering who Jesus really is. Verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
when you remove the impurities of gold by intense heat, when God is ready, the impurities are gone, and he reveals himself in the finished work. Now, in verses 10 through 12, listen, folks, the prophets, they had the promise of God. As a matter of fact, when you look at uh, how Peter concludes the first 12 verses, uh, beginning with verse 10, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come. So the word that was given to the prophet was something that would happen. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when, his, when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed, not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you to those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. I'll close with this. In the Old Testament, they were saved by faith. But when I read verses 11 and 12, the Bible says, let me read it again, verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them. The Holy Spirit was alive and well in the Old Testament. Lives were being changed. Look at the bottom of verse 12. Who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The Holy Spirit of God changed lives then and is continuing to change lives now. And if you're going to stand as a Christian, it's going to have to be God in you, Christ in you. Because you and me will fail every time. We'll run, we'll quit, and we'll find every reason in the world to blame somebody else for the, for the decisions we've made. But Peter says, stand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Amen? On Christ the solid rock I stand. God calls us, first of all, to be saved. He calls us to be obedient. And to be obedient, you've got to be clean. Let's all stand together. Every, every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm talking to you, Christian, this morning. Knowing that you've given your life to Christ. Are you clean? So that, so that, that one thing, that little thing in your life that's popping up right now that's what you need to give God well how do I do it brother Greg right where you stand identify it in your mind and call it out to God say Lord forgive me help me I want to be clean I want to stand Maybe you're here today and you say, Brother Greg, you know, I saw Journey baptized, but I, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. But I want to be. want to be. Would you take your faith and, as a little child and place it in Christ this morning? In the quietness of your heart, oh God, I need you. I'm lost. And I realize today that you came to die for me. And that you rose from the grave so that I could live forever. That heaven would be my home. So Lord Jesus, right now I give you my life. I surrender my life. Once and for all, right now. To you. song we are about to sing is called Time After Time and I wonder if you've sensed God dealing with your heart and maybe have walked away from it and today he knocks one more time how about you Lord have your way
Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for your word. Help us to stand in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed to receive Christ this morning, God bless your heart. We invite you to come. Do I have to say anything, Brother Greg? No. We want you to come and step out unashamed of your decision. And we're going to celebrate that new life in Christ with you. Maybe God's dealing with you about another decision. You're always welcome to come and pray. Let's be obedient. Let's sing. Lift your voice. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come near? There's nothing in this world to keep you To see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come And all of God's people say, Amen. 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 God bless you for being here. I hope that uh, many of you that work are off tomorrow, get a day off, and you can enjoy your time together. And just take a little breather. It is hard to believe it is September. And uh, here we are. Today is Bread Sunday. If you'd like to give $1, it goes directly to our food pantry. Uh, our requests for the food pantry have been slow up to this point. And the last few weeks, it's really picked up quickly. So this is a great blessing. Roy and Kathy Howe take care of that on behalf of the church. And we're grateful for the ministry that that provides. So you'll see uh, Murph out there with the bread basket. Also, if you'd like to give, I thank you for your faithful giving. You'll see the giving boxes right inside the doors on the way out. You can drop your offering in there. And I want to continue to thank those that are able to give online as it's been a great blessing to us. Okay? Are all hearts clear this morning? Anybody have anything to say? Anybody mad at anybody? By the way, if you are, you handle that with them, not the public world. Amen. I love my church. God bless you. Let that be the benediction. Have a great day. To God be the glory.